So what happened with that then? How did that get overturned? The, the appellate court, the three judges in the appellate court ruled in our favor. They they upheld the lower court's decision of uh, vindicating the, the our position on the case. Mm-hmm. Uh, the you know they argue that the uh, that the pesticide regulation laws uh, uh, clearly define the that the state does govern and has say oh, has say over all the, the use and transportation and application of pesticides and that that, that there is preemptive preemption language in the law and that's and that's true. And that came out of a, a Mendocino, a, 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 something that happened in Mendocino where there were some school children injured in a school bus that was caused by an overspray, an aerial overspray of an herbicide in a timber area. And as a result of that, the county of Mendocino passed a ordinance that, that regulated the application of, the, of that herbicide. The applicator uh, at the time, or I'm not sure if it was the applicator or the, the timber co- limber, the lumber company uh, challenged that ordinance uh, and that challenge went to the state Supreme Court where they lost. Mm-hmm. And the, the state Supreme Court upheld the Mendocino County's regulation and right to make to, to, to create that, that law. Subsequently, the um, a new law was passed in the legislature uh, that that made it illegal for counties to regulate the use of pesticides, and that was that law that was uh, brought into question in this case. And the our attorney argued that if the legislation had intended intended for the uh, judicial system to not hear damage cases, they would have said so specifically in the law, uh, and that we argued that the law was written to preempt uh, counties, cities, and towns, lower government agencies from creating new laws, not from uh, from aggrieved party or damaged parties from bringing a, a, um, a tort case to, to, the, to, to the judicial system. And in fact, the same bodies of laws has many examples of of um, affirming the the right of individuals to bring claim, and it's a, in my opinion their their case was weak. There was a, a there was quite a bit of uh, historical information in the in the record that um, upheld our position that the judicial branch was not being preempted by by this regulation. So that was part of the, the appeal. The other part of the appeal was they argued that the case had been heard by the um, by the county ag commissioner and that the in the county ag commissioner had found that there was no buddy at fault and so hence that they were being tried or, or judged again when it was taken to uh to a jury trial, and that even if we didn't like the decision that the county ag commissioner made, that we had a an appeal process that was in place that we could have gone back and appealed that decision that the county ag commissioner made, and we didn't see that see it that way. We so, oh, from our perspective, the county ag commissioner's decision was not a decision that uh, that affected us, and. Had, they had not said that we had done anything wrong, but there was nothing for us to appeal. Because uh, the way that's set up is a, a county ag commissioner may find that an applicator has um, has done something, has applied a pesticide incorrectly, and that they then the applicator may be fined, and you know may have their license taken away if it's a real severe break, uh, an aggrieved, egregious uh, act. Mm-hmm. It's so, a, there was nobody, you know, we weren't we weren't fined and we we weren't reprimanded by the county ag commissioner. We didn't have anything to appeal. So there wasn't 
the system wasn't really set up to uh, to address a uh, this kind of a situation, and it wasn't what it was meant for. So, in all counts, the the appeal court uh, vindicated our position and felt felt like we had a strong we made a strong uh, argument for upholding the lower court decision. Well, it sounds and like there's a lot ended. of opportunity, and I think probably we've seen that in the news where where the court systems, the law does not work, <laughs> and at this time it did, and that. It's encouraging. It's very encouraging. Uh, and we, we're going to take a break right now, but we'd like to talk about uh, GMO alfalfa and what your take is on how that was just kind of passed through uh, just recently. And we'll be right back with Larry Jacobs, Organic Farmer on Food Integrity Now. Welcome back to Food Integrity Now. We've been talking with Larry Jacobs, Organic Farmer. He won a court case, very encouragingly, uh, Concerning contamination of his fields uh, with a pesticide. And um, we wanted to, you know, I think as you were talking, it became apparent to me why it's so overwhelming, I think, for farmers to want to even take on these these types of battles because the law is so complicated and there are so many ways for it to be uh, to be interpreted that, you know, it it might end up failing or uh, I'm sure that you are familiar with that, with that feeling, but uh, I wanted to ask what your take is on what happened with GMO alfalfa, which has been a big battle, I think uh, being passed regardless of, of all of those that were opposed. Right. So it was, disheartening to hear the recent uh, announcement uh, from USDA that GMO alfalfa has been deregulated. I'm not sure if that's the right term. I think it is. Yeah, Yeah, it is. That that sounds right to me. Yeah. What's disconcerting about the deregulation of GMO alfalfa is that Pollen from alfalfa is insect carry. It hence the uh, likelihood of of uh, contamination of, of pollinization of alfalfa plants that are not GMO alfalfa. Hence the integrity of future alfalfa seed to be GMO free is is highly at risk. Which it, which also you know is going to affect our our dairy and our meat and um, it's it really is disheartening. Right. So so that's where where this goes is that the dairy industry and the meat industry, the organic dairy industry, right, and the organic meat industry depend on alfalfa as a the feed source, especially during the winter. And if they can't find a source of organic alfalfa, they won't be in compliance with the National Organic Food Act. Mm-hmm. And that presents a conundrum. Uh, setting aside the concerns and the that people have regarding uh, the, the potential um, the negative impacts of consuming products that are genetically modified. It's, it's sometimes that not being a well understood area or not not well researched area that just looking at the regu- today's regulation uh, organic dairy producers or, and organic meat producers are going to have one heck of a time finding a source of, of alfalfa at some point in the future that has not been does not have some genetic markers in it of GMO, uh, uh, genetically modified crop. How do you and think... That th- is, that's, that's really difficult. Right. The ability to prevent the contamination of non-GMO crops with pollen from GMO crops is what 
is what is what creates the problem. And how do you think how do you think this happened with the USDA? What's your what's your take? I mean, I, I obviously have a take on it, and we, we've talked about this quite a bit on our show, but uh, f- from the perspective of being an organic farmer, how do you think this happened? 